everyone. I'm presenting the White House's revolving door visiting the Roosevelt's 1933 to 1945. I chose them because every time the White House, of course, has a lot of visitors, everyone does, but the Roosevelt's had been there for 11 years, and so they had more than their fair share. I'm especially indebted to two books about from staff who were there then, My 30 Years Back Stairs at the White House by Lillian Rogers Park and J.B. West Upstairs at the White House. And uh, Presidential Anecdotes by Paul Bowler. So they were a tremendous help. Well, the First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt made quite an impression on the very first day she was in the White House. Uh, Mrs. R actually helped the butlers to serve the luncheon, and she didn't serve her husband, the president, first, which shocked the staff. But uh, it apparently was a very successful luncheon because some of them were still there for the 4 p.m. tea, and was totally against the rather stratified White House protocol, especially under the very, very proper Hoover's. So it was quite a shakeup. Now, there are a lot of growing pains, and even though the White House is fairly large, uh, the family had five grown children, a lot of friends, and sometimes they always had to keep uh, things going. And one of the things was that Mrs. R actually gave up her bedroom for guests, and she occupied what is now the sewing room. And, uh, in order to make room and as people often had to be moved around as people came and uh, in one memorable incident um, she was going to visit uh, one of the, the permanent guests who will come to later Joseph Lash and she just knocked and walked in and what she found was a half naked male valet and immediately after she called the chief usher and in her iciest voice requested that all bedroom moves had to be given to her first before the move was done. And this is the person who had overall charge. The office of the chief usher still manages the White House. And at the time they had Mr. Krim, he's oversaw staffing, housekeeping matters. And uh, these are some of the servants who made it possible. Alonzo feels he served every family uh, from the Hoover City Eisenhower's. So he was there for four administrations. He also uh, struck a blow for freedom because in 1931, he protested the different uh, staff dining rooms that were segregated by race. And he pointed out to the Hoovers that, you know, they work together side by side every day, so why should they eat separately? And later on, he wrote uh, a book about his experiences. And Matthew Rogers, she was actually Lillian uh, Rogers Park's mother. And she came into the White House in 1909 as Mrs. Taft's hairdresser. And actually, she delayed her retirement in 1939 in order to help the White House host Queen Elizabeth's parents, King George and Queen Elizabeth of England in 1939. Now, uh, aside from Mr. Krim, uh, Mrs. R hired uh, a, a local neighbor to be the housekeeper and Henrietta Nesbitt didn't really have a lot of experience. She ran a bakery in near Hyde Park, but they were friends, so they joined the staff and uh, she took care of things for multitudes of visitors. And uh, one of the things, <clears throat> excuse me, Mrs. R pointed out was that in one of her radio broadcasts is that everyone had to adjust to a certain way of living. And she pointed out that there were things that were done in the White House long before a presidential family came and would be done long after. 
And uh, here's an example of this. Margaret Truman recalled her first invitation to the White House was when she was 11 years old. And uh, when she uh, got the invitation, um, her mother noticed that she, Margaret was identified as the eligible daughter of the junior senator from Missouri. And in her response, accepting the invitation, she pointed out to Mrs. R that at 11, Margaret wasn't eligible for anything yet, but that was the White House. Now, uh, Mrs. Nesbitt had some rather lackluster meals. Uh, the first lady asked her to actually uh, keep the house running as economically as possible, which of course in the depression made sense. And also she meant it as a learning laboratory, as an example for Americans who needed to economize in their household arrangements, but didn't make for very good meals. And uh, like for instance, uh, Henrietta bought you know, common meat cuts, canned goods, and they even developed a five uh, or 10 cent meal, which consisted of a main course of stuffed eggs prepared uh, by mashing five hard cooked yolks with a teaspoon of vinegar and half a teaspoon of minced onion. A thin coat of tomato sauce covered the eggs, <clears throat> which were served hot, accompanied by mashed potatoes. So it wasn't, and the dessert was a less than drilling prune whip. And she and FDR often had traded barbs about Mrs. Nesbitt. Uh, the president absolutely hated her cooking. And one time there was a memorable exchange when he fired off a complaint to uh, the East Wing where Eleanor's office was. And uh, he complained he had been served chicken six times a week. And within a month, he was writing another note complaining that he was not getting any chicken, um, but sweetbreads instead, which the result that he was becoming very unsweet. And uh, you know, with typical Roosevelt humor, he ended by saying that as a result, he had bitten two foreign dignitaries. But uh, anyway, uh, Mrs. R was very devoted to Mrs. Nesbitt, and she stayed the entire administration, even though the president didn't really care for her cooking. There were other hazards too, because even though the family was known to have a Scotty dog named Fala, um, he had several dogs, and one of them was a German Shepherd Wolf, who actually managed to bite the New York Times food critic. And Mrs. R said that, told the staff that they had better have the curochrome and band-aids handy in case the next time happened. Apparently there was no question that Wolf would have to be relocated. Now a frequent guest was the president's mother, Sarah Roosevelt, and uh, she didn't care for the, uh, the hotel atmosphere she found in the busy house. And uh, she was very respected by the staff. According to Mrs. Park, she said that uh, they would always obey her commands unless it actually contradicted the first ladies. And this was one memorable guest, uh, Alexander Wolcott. He was literally a commentator, radio personality, charter member of the Algonquin Roundtable, all around raconteur, and a true crime expert extraordinaire. And this is a picture of him in costume for the man who came to dinner, which was actually based on Wolcott. Um, he was a guest of one of the playwrights, Moss Hart, and he arrived early and had the houses at sixes and sevens before the Harts got there at their home in Bucks County. And so when he finally left, Hart proposed to his co-writer, George F. Kaufman, saying, 
what do you think would happen if he had broken his leg? And that's how the whole play, The Man Who Came to Dinner, was born. So anyway, he was staying there uh, while he was playing Sheridan Whiteside in Washington. And they assigned him the Queen's bedroom, uh, which was because uh, named for King Charles's grandmother, Elizabeth, and generally high-ranking female personalities are uh, put up there. And he literally took over, as he had done before. He once actually had a phone installed at his host's expense so that he would have his own private line. And uh, he was really something else. And uh, his his visit was for several days, but he wound up staying two weeks. And he really put a strain on the staff. One of the things he did is that after the show, he would invite the entire cast back to have dinners. And they would often last well after midnight. And uh, uh, the staff knew that the Roosevelt's were very distressed about it, but they didn't know quite how to bring it up. And so they allowed him to stay, but they actually lost one of the kitchen chefs because he resigned saying that, you know, I'm used to a lot of things, but, you know, 2 a.m., oh, no. And uh, this is the Roosevelt kitchen that had to be kept open far into the night. Well, finally, things came to a head, and he actually, Wolcott had to go, because uh, Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands was supposed to occupy the room, and uh, that day, Mrs. R took charge. She marched in with the, the, some of the maids, and they started packing and uh, cleaning, and she thanked Mr. Wolcott for visiting, and she hoped that he would come again, and... Uh, and characteristically for him, he took it with very good humor and actually did stay in, in again. And he so enjoyed his experience that he once wrote to a fellow actor that if he ever played in Washington, he should get an invitation. Because in his words, he said, Mrs. R runs the best boarding house in town. <laughs> now, uh, you know, politically, it was a whole different world then, and this was a guest who wasn't invited, uh, four-time Olympic gold uh, uh, winner, uh, uh, was not invited to uh, uh, the White House because it was uh, Jesse Owens and Frank Metcalf were both on the team, and uh, it was just too much political risk. At, in 1936, it was an election year. Um, FDR had an anti-lynching bill that he was trying to get passed. He needed the goodwill of Southern white Democrats. And uh, so Owens and Metcalf were not invited. And uh, it was just, uh, just as an aside, an anti-lynching bill was finally passed and signed into law last year by President Joe Biden. So this was a long odyssey. Now, one uh, African-American who attended uh, regularly in the White House was educator Mary McLeod Bethune. And if you know Bethune Cookman uh, University, and Daytona Beach, that was her. And uh, it, it wasn't always a very popular move, excuse me. But uh, uh, Mrs. R worked very closely with her and enjoyed her company. In fact, uh, J.B. West said she would actually almost skip down uh, the path from the front door, and they would walk arm in arm back into the house. And uh, unlike previous White Houses, uh, they actually invited a lot of movie stars, and many times it's because they had a March of Dimes specials on the radio to raise money to cure polio. 
And this is a good point to bring up because I'm going to talk about the wheelchair not in the room because it was not exactly a secret that the president had polio, but the president's circle did many things in their power to try to minimize that. For instance, there are no photographs of him in his wheelchair. And uh, as uh, Mrs. Park said, he was literally hauled out and put into a, a limousine like a sack of potatoes because of the very heavy braces he wore. And uh, so it was a really important cause for everybody, but they also had other tricks like, for instance, at state dinners, the first lady would lead the guests in from one of the adjoining state parlors and the president would already be seated. One of the movie stars who came was Red Skelton, shown here at the Hollywood, uh, you know, Grauman's Chinese Theater, uh, getting his fingerprints. And <coughs> it was uh, some suitcases luggage in the hallway when they were arriving. And he just said, Eleanor's off again, and referring to her frequent trips around the country and FDR's behalf. Now, one exciting visitor was uh, Amelia Earhart. She was being entertained because she was the first woman ever to fly the Atlantic Ocean, which paradoxically happened to be twice. She flew as a, a part of the crew in 1928 with two male pilots and on her own right four years later in 1932 either way she was still the first woman to fly across the atlantic so at the dinner for them she, she and the first lady actually slipped out towards the end of the dinner and uh this Earhart actually took her for a short hop from washington to baltimore about 45 miles and supposedly, this is hard, even got a chance for a minute at the controls. So uh, that must have been pretty thrilling. Now, a very important visit was the King George VI and Queen Elizabeth on the state visit. And uh, uh, actually, uh, there were very few times uh, any of the English monarchs ever actually visited the United States. For instance, uh, Queen Victoria never did. And it was quite a big deal. Now, she said that uh, the king and uh, the queen were very, very gracious uh, guests. However, uh, her staff had a less than ideal impression on the king and queen's servants. She said, uh, according to Mrs. Uh, uh, Park, that they constantly complained about the, the food. They constantly complained about their lodgings. They pointed out that as uh, servants to the king, they had their own servants. And it was not a happy meeting. And uh, Winston Churchill was an important visitor uh, just he, after the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941. And he proved to be an important guest because uh, he and the president were putting together the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. I'm sure you've been hearing a lot about NATO recently. And he was a very eccentric guest, according to Mr. West, because he was in the habit of uh, taking frequent uh, baths and uh, in private, he would wear what he called a siren suit. It was like a, a cotton jumper that was belted in the middle. And uh, because of his baths, the staff found that he uh, could often be found to be totally naked in his room. And uh, as Mr. West pointed out, when you entered this room, it was either the siren suit or nothing. And uh, Mrs. Orr wrote about her guest, and uh, she, this is what she said. 
I was late arriving at the, at the Office of Civilian Defense yesterday morning because the president has been very mysterious as to what was going to happen over these holidays, finally decided to tell me that the British Prime Minister, Mr. Winston Churchill and his party were arriving sometime in the late afternoon or evening. It had not occurred to the president that this might require uh, certain moving of furniture to adapt rooms to the purposes for which the prime minister wished to use them. And of course, a wartime security, uh, the, the notice of the visit had to be as secret as possible. And uh, it took time uh, to get everything together, but they did it. Another foreign special guest was uh, Sun Mei Ling. She was the wife of, of Chinese President Chiang Kai-shek. And this is a picture of her and uh, Mrs. Roosevelt on the White House lawn on February 24th, 1943. And there was a lot of interesting things about their visit. For instance, uh, uh, Mei Ling actually bought her own silken sheets to sleep on, which uh, the White House staff had to, uh, to launder and put them in these like, uh, canvas linen uh, bags and to allow them to dry to be used again. And they arrived with a party of 100 and there were so many uh, people that some of them had to be put up in the Chinese embassy. And the ones who actually were actually in the house, one of them turned out to be a cross-dressing uh, woman in a man's suit. And uh, I'm not sure if the Roosevelt's uh, certainly knew uh, about it, perhaps, but uh, I definitely know the staff did because Mr. Krim sent up some, uh, one of the White House butlers to be a valet and he came back and reported in an odd voice that Mr. Soon was actually a woman. And so Mr. Krim sent up some maids to help her. And it was never exactly explained why she chose to wear Western male garb. But uh, she even fooled the president who grandly addressed her as my boy. Another visit was uh, uh, Molotov, and you've heard of Molotov cocktails. Uh, he was, uh, Alonso Fields was asked to get something that Molotov needed and to summon his valet. And when he did, he uh, knocked into the room and found a naked woman valet who had, was not embarrassed at all to have him come in to see her. Something more serious about Molotov is that they found a handgun in his luggage, which they had to confiscate. Now, an important part of Mrs. Roosevelt's mission was for polio infantile paralysis was the host uh, tea time. And these, some of these were very small intimate affairs. Some of them were so uh, grand that they had to be moved into the East Room and uh, her secretary uh, actually re remembered once that uh, she was serving the British ambassador and she just said, you know, coffee, tea or cocoa. And he says, Madam, I have come here for tea. Now the secret service had to do a lot of careful handling and a lot of planning, especially in wartime, to actually make all this actually work for the president and his family and their many, many guests. One of the things they did was to set up uh, a desk where uh, parcels, camera bags, everything had to be left there while people visited. Of course, this is a, an unplanned guest. Uh, sometimes Mrs. Roosevelt would actually bring back a destitute man she met on the street. And it sounds funny to us now, but I mean, uh, presidential families had a lot more freedom to sort of walk around uh, 
and everything. And even though she probably had a civil ser uh, secret service escort, I mean, if she saw some uh, poor man begging or something, she would impulsively invite him back to the White House uh, for a meal and to see what could be done for him to help him. And what was really funny is that eventually she was so busy that uh, the whole task, if they uh, she brought them back, the, she, she would turn the man over to the staff and they would try to, you know, do what they could to clean his clothes and the person to make him more presentable to be received by the first lady and the president. So it was quite a struggle sometime, according to them. And some of the visitors were avid souvenir hunters. And in one case, Mrs. Park had to replace uh, fringe curtains. She actually had to uh, take all the fringes off and re-sew it to make a plain border because people were snipping off bits of the fringe. And some of the visitors were starstruck Mrs. Park said that one time when she was at the camera and parcel desk, a pro football team who was missing, they all requested to touch her hand because they asked her if she had she got a chance to see the president. She said she saw him almost every day and they all wanted to touch her hand. It was really funny. And uh, sometimes uh, they had uh, the Roosevelt's were so busy that they couldn't always dedicate as much time to their guests as they wished. And actually, according to uh, Mr. West, uh, basically the guests sort of came and went as they pleased with no particular planned things with the First Lady. And uh, it was really uh, funny because uh, there was one woman who uh, actually complained that uh, she wrote to the first lady telling them that uh, she had soiled her glove on a mantelpiece and she told her she needed to stay home and take better care of the house. And as she described, she said it was disgraceful. And uh, one of some of the special occasion visitors, they did various things. One of the things was the Christmas tree lighting. And in 1941, the Christmas tree was brought in from the lifts outside the White House grounds into the grounds. And this is the president's making a speech, which is actually on the internet archive. You can actually find it and uh, about Christmas and lighting the tree. And uh, it was a very good speech, but uh, it's never been taken out of the grounds. It, it was put in there for security and it's it stayed there. Now, he had a number of semi-permanent guests and the, one of the most important was Louis Howe. And he was literally the architect that got FDR elected governor of New York and got him elected president in 1932. And uh, while in dispensal, he was very eccentric. And it, because of his small stature, uh, which was sometimes health related, uh, he described himself as a medieval gnome. And it was he, according to Mrs. R, who taught her how to speak in public, who has when he, before he became governor, when he was stricken with infantile paralysis, Louis Howe said she had to go out there and speak to women's groups to sort of keep her husband's name going to keep his political career alive. And she did, but um, she said that, uh, she even admitted that uh, she had uh, a habit of nervously laughing and Hal told her to not laugh unless there was something to laugh about. And according to her, he told her, you know, have something to say, get up, say it, and sit down. 
and another was uh, Marguerite Lahan, known as Missy, and she joined FDR as governor and served as his personal secretary and lived in the White House until the 1940s when she was stricken by a stroke and died in 1944. And uh, they had a, a very close relationship. The nature of the relationship with the president remains unclear, but uh, she was very devoted to FDR and really devoted her entire life to him. And Eleanor also had her own special favorite. It was a newspaper woman named Lorena Hickok. And there have often uh, been <laughs> speculation because of the letters between them that they may have had a possibly lesbian relationship. And no one knows for sure. Um, and of course, one of the things that cloud the issue is that um, Eleanor, being born in 1884, had this effusive Victorian way of expressing emotions in letters. And sometimes when we read those letters by her and other people, they sound very romantic and very, you know, close when they're not really as close as we think. Now, one contribution Lorena made is that she told the first lady that uh, only male reporters were allowed to press conferences with the president. And she told her that she should hold her own for uh, women reporters only. And they eventually got to a point where it was mostly things about household things and family welfare, sort of general charity, you know, so-called women's uh, things. But they gradually morphed into serious in news about actual public policy. And so they actually helped a lot of women keep their jobs because in the Depression, it would have been very easy for them to say, oh, well, we don't need a society writer. We don't need a uh, an opera writer. We just need a reporter. And so it allowed a lot of them to keep their jobs. Now, Harry Hopkins was basically like Louis Howe, indispensable in his own way because he actually uh, managed the whole Works Progress Administration for FDR and reported directly to him. And uh, he actually had his own separate uh, house, but when his wife died, the president invited him to live with his daughter in the White House so that, you know, he would be there whenever the president needed him. And Diana is shown here posing with Mrs. R and two of her grandchildren. And... Uh, According to staff, she led a very lonely existence in the White House. I mean, there were virtually no children her age. Um, the president's children were all grown and living separately. The uh, grandchildren were really too young to be much company for her. And sometimes she would uh, put things in a small satchel and sort of hide out and disappear and go to uh, a friend's house to stay overnight. Now, here's Joseph Lash again. Uh, the First Lady met him through uh, the, uh, the National Students Union, and they worked on many social causes, and she invited him to uh, live in the White House. And uh, I mean, he, when he got married, she even invited him to share his quarters with his wife. And uh, so he was there a long time, and later on, he actually wrote one of the more definitive uh, biographies of the president and the first lady. Now, here's a guess Eleanor didn't want. Uh, the president asked his daughter, Anna Bottiger, to invite Mrs. Mercy. Uh, now, going back in ancient history, in the teens, 
when he was assistant secretary of the Navy, Franklin had an affair with Lucy Mercer, who was his secretary, and it caused an inviolable rift between Eleanor and Franklin. And many people who knew them and biographers say that they made a great team politically, but personally their marriage was just a shambles. And um, uh, whenever Eleanor was away, he would in ask Anna to invite Mrs. Uh, by that time, she was Mrs. Rutherford, she was a widow. And actually, uh, Lucy was actually with the president when he died in Warm Springs, Georgia. And supposedly after the funeral, uh, Mrs. R had this really serious fight with Anna. Uh, and she felt her own daughter had betrayed her. And uh, it was very, very serious break between them. Eventually things uh, calmed down. Uh, a few years later, Anna posted uh, a television program on political uh, personalities and our first guest was her mother. But, you know, because of the heightened emotions of FDR's funeral and the knowledge she was told by a cousin that Lucy had actually been there when the president had his stroke. It was a real wound to Eleanor. And this brings us to the end of the Roosevelt White House. Uh, when the president had a stroke in April of 1945, his body was brought back by train and laid state for visitors in the East Room and then went on to public view with the Capitol Rotunda, which is what's normally done for uh, presidents. And even when they're not president, for instance, former President Reagan actually lay in state in uh, the Capitol, not in the White House, but in the Capitol. And uh, so after 11, more than 11 years, everything was ready to be wrapped up. And Margaret Truman accompanied her mother on the customary White House tour, which is basically a two hour tour where the outgoing first lady introduces uh, the incoming first lady to uh, major department heads and explains how things are done, who does what, and shows her the rooms. And uh, <laughs> Mrs. Roosevelt was obliged to actually confess that the entire house was overrun with rats. And that got to be a problem for the Trumans later on. And eventually uh, they had to be eliminated when the house underwent extensive renovations between 1948 and 1952, where uh, the whole house was reduced to the bare outside walls and many things had to be replaced. So that is the end. I hope you enjoyed this and I enjoyed presenting it to you. And thanks again for seeing this. Goodbye.